Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Blair Elliott. I am the Communications and Events Associate here at the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to acknowledge that McGill University is located on land which has long served as a site of meeting and exchange among Indigenous people, including the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabeg nations. We do this to acknowledge the importance of the land on which we work, study, and live, and to acknowledge the complex web of relationships of which we are all a part. We would like to welcome you tonight to a lecture on Marshall McLuhan and the October Crisis in Quebec, featuring Professor Jonathan Slater. This event was brought to you by the BMP Rotating Lecture Program in Canadian Studies, established in 2013 as a formal partnership among the Canadian Studies programs at McGill University, Bridgewater State University, and SUNY College at Plattsburgh. The lectureship is designed to strengthen connection between these programs, to share expertise in the area of Canadian studies, and to expand audiences and interests in the field. There will be a Q&A tonight following the lecture, and we invite attendees to use the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen to put forth your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will be taking questions in French and English tonight. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be uploaded online to our YouTube channel next week. You can also watch all of our past events there as well. To start off tonight, I would like to introduce Danielle Benal, the director of the McGill Institute for the Study of Canada, and James McGill Professor in the Department of Political Science at McGill. Daniel? Thank you very much, uh, Blair. Hello, everyone. Uh, good, uh, good evening. Uh, la crise d'octobre est un moment capital de notre histoire et nous sommes heureux aujourd'hui d'accueillir uh, Jonathan Slater pour nous offrir une perspective unique sur ce qui s'est passé il y a exactement 50 ans. Jonathan Slater is director of the Institute of Ethics uh, in Public Life at SUNY Plattsburgh, where he chairs the Department of Journalism and Public Relations and directs the Jewish Studies program. Professor Slater also is a faculty associate in the college's Center for the Study of Canada. He currently is researching and writing a book on mass media's role in the tumultuous years between Quebec's quiet revolution and the October crisis. Slater completed his doctorate in media ecology at uh, New York University. Jonathan, thank you very much for agreeing to give this talk, which again is part of uh, this wonderful BMP rotating lecture uh, program with our friends in the United States, Bridgewater State University and your school, uh, SUNY College at Plattsburgh. So uh, we are honored uh, to um, uh, really uh, listen to your talk and I will be back during the, the Q&A which uh, as Blair mentioned will be bilingual. Uh, merci Jonathan, c'est à toi. You're on mute. That's because you told me to mute. <laughs> I'd like to thank the McGill Institute for the study of Canada for its warm welcome this afternoon and uh, Dr. Bellin for his kind invitation to have me join esteemed colleagues and students today at McGill. For many years, the intellectual home of Montreal author Hugh McLennan, whom I'm going to be speaking about a little bit later. And of course, I'm grateful to Fulbright Canada for its support of the BMP rotating lecture program in uh, Canadian studies. I'm also delighted that friends and colleagues from the Media Ecology Association, both here in Canada and south of the border are uh, in attendance today. Uh, while I would have uh, much preferred to find myself standing before you last spring at McGill, it's fortuitous nonetheless that my talk was postponed until this month the 50th anniversary of the October uh, crisis. Blair, we can go to the first slide. Um, by October 1970, uh, 1970, Canada was deploying armed forces against its own citizens, prompting some to wonder what had happened to the peaceful nation of order and good government. 50 years later, the October crisis continues to occupy a special place in Quebec's identity. This anniversary serves as a reminder of Canada's constitutional paradoxes, uh, 
and that unusual politics is politics as usual for both Quebec and the rest of Canada. Next slide, please. In the early afternoon of Thursday, October 15th, 1970, a light rain was falling on Memorial Stadium in Baltimore, where more than 45,000 baseball fans gathered for game five of the World Series. The Orioles, whose impressive roster included Brooks Robinson and Boog Powell, were hosting the Cincinnati Reds, whose lineup boasted Pete Rose and Johnny Bench. Some distance away in Montreal, thousands of fans were either at work listening on their transistor, transistor radios or at home watching NBC's Kurt Gowdy call the decisive game carried on Canadian television by the CBC. As viewers in Quebec witnessed Baltimore recover from Cincinnati's early lead, the CBC frequently cut into the broadcast with special bulletins about the kidnapping of a British diplomat and a Quebec cabinet minister by a radical group of separatists. Next slide. Ten days earlier, members of the Fonds de Libération du Québec, or FLQ, had kidnapped James Cross, the British Trade Commissioner, from his home in westbound Quebec as his wife looked on helplessly. The FLQ threatened to execute Cross if the federal and provincial governments did not meet the group's demands, including the public broadcast of a manifesto, the freeing of 23 so-called political prisoners, safe passage to Cuba or Algeria, and a half million dollars. Born in 1963, the FLQ committed numerous acts of violence in the years leading up to the October crisis, including more than 200 bombings and dozens of armed robberies. Next slide. The federal government partially acquiesced and allowed an anchorman for Radio-Canada, the CBC's French language arm, to read the FFQ's manifesto over the air on October 8th, and in so doing, hoped the population of Quebec would see the FFQ for a bunch of terrorists. But much of the manifesto's content struck a chord among many Quebec francophones, trade unions, student activists, and members of the church hierarchy, among others, openly sympathized with the tenor of the manifesto. The next day, the FLQ announced the postponement of Cross's execution until the following evening, October 10th. Quebec's justice minister firmly rejected the rest of the FLQ's demands minutes before the deadline, except for one, safe passage out of the country. Less than an hour later, an FLQ cell abducted Quebec labor minister and deputy premier Pierre Laporte, kidnapping him while he played with his children on the front lawn of his home in saint Lambert, just a few minutes away from where I'm speaking to you right now. The FLQ threatened Le Port II with execution. On October 12th, the provincial government entered into negotiations with the FLQ, and on October 13th, the federal government deployed Canadian Forces troops to Ottawa in order to protect government buildings there. Next slide. Clearly troubled by the visible military presence in the capital, one CBC reporter asked Canadian Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau how far he was willing to go to thwart the designs of the FLQ. In a response that was to take on abundant meaning in the television age, Trudeau flippantly retorted, just watch me. Next slide. As Baltimore was about to clinch the major league championship with a 9-3 victory over the Reds, anywhere between 1,000 and 7,500 Canadian soldiers, depending on whose account one trusts, took up positions in and around Montreal as part of Operation Essay. We can go to the next slide. Ostensibly, at the invitation of Quebec Premier Robert Bourassa, the soldiers were deployed in order to contain a perceived threat of insurrection against the elected government of Quebec. At 4 a.m. on Friday, October 16th, Trudeau invoked the War Measures Act, automatically suspending civil liberties throughout the country, and later that day announced his government's decision on television, calling the FLQ bandits. The Canadian government immediately declared the clandestine FLQ an outlaw group. Next slide. Authorities began to jail people without a warrant, restrict the movements of ordinary citizens, and impose censorship on print and broadcast media. Radio-Canada, for instance, pulled from its schedule a Perry Mason episode dealing with ter terrorism. With the military keeping the peace on the streets, police concentrated on searching for crosses and Laporte's captors. Before sunup, Police had conducted a sweeping search of homes and rounded up and imprisoned 250 people, and that number in the following uh, uh, couple of days uh, rose to about 450. Uh, next slide. So Montrealers waking up that Friday morning were convinced the country was at war. Next slide. On October 17th, Pierre Laporte was found dead, 
stuffed in the trunk of a car not from, far from where I live on Montreal's South Shore. James Cross was freed after almost two months in captivity in exchange for safe passage to Cuba for a handful of FLQ members. Other cell members were caught and later convicted. Promising to keep the War Measures Act in force until April, Trudeau withdrew troops from Quebec in January 1971. Next slide. Okay, take a little pause in the slides here. The end of the Second World War brought a wave of industrialization to Quebec that continued unabated through the 1950s. Hundreds of thousands of Quebec francophones had uprooted themselves from the agrarian region and were pouring into Montreal. Yet many of the avenues to promotion and advancement in urban jobs remained closed to Quebec francophones who were compelled to speak English while on the job. The quiet revolution of 1960 reversed years of stagnation that typified the regime of Premier Maurice Duplessis during La Grande Noisseur. The quiet revolution ushered in a large, educated middle class with young francophones entering university on a scale not previously seen in Quebec. A new breed of francophone intellectuals established themselves in the civil service, private business, education, and the growing communications sector. The church, which had worked in close alliance with the English business elite, was pushed to the margins, a considerable feat, given that nowhere else in Canada did the church exercise, as Marty Lubin points out, the control and supervision of social life as it possessed in the province of Quebec. Since the British conquest of North America in 1760, the Catholic Church in French Canada, in partnership with the ruling English intelligentsia, infantilized the majority population and imposed on them their doctrines and educational methods. French Canadians by and large tolerated their subordinate relationship and accommodated their own oppression. The chasm separating French and English in Quebec therefore emerges as a drama of colonization and defeat, a narrative of subjugation, and a deeply rooted divide that today is euphemistically referred to as two solitudes, a coinage derived from Canadian author Hugh McLennan's 1945 novel of the same name. According to Charles Taylor, the two solitudes are like two photographs of the same object taken from such different points of view that they cannot be superimposed. In the wake of the quiet revolution, Quebec francophones developed an increasingly acute awareness of their old unconscious environments, a term used by Marshall McLuhan. An environment is naturally of low intensity or low definition. That is why it escapes our observation, McLuhan observes. Hannah Arendt writes, no one questions or examines what is obvious to all. The hegemony of the English-speaking environment that had for so long served to suppress any ambitions French speakers might have, uh, ha might have had soon flipped into an anti-environment that would propel the province into violent confrontations over the course of a decade. Let's resume the slides. Quebec's need to unplug from French Canada's colonial past was not lost on Pierre Vallière, an FLQ militant arrested during the October crisis. Valier is best known for what Northrop Fry calls his manifesto of radical French-Canadian protest, Negre Blanc d'Amérique. Written while Valier was incarcerated in the infamous Tombs prison in Lower Manhattan and published in 1968, Negre Blanc d'Amérique compares the peripheralization of the Quebec francophones to the plight of the blacks in the United States. Next slide. Valier, who had been touring U.S. cities in an effort to link the struggles of Quebec francophones to black liberation movements in America, saw parallels between his fight and that of Malcolm X, assassinated three years earlier. No sane black man wants integration, Malcolm writes in his autobiography. For the black man in America, the only solution is complete separation from the white man. At home, too, Quebec francophones and anglophones were likely drawing parallels from news reports about mounting racial tensions south of the border. Francophone activists, in particular, were paying close attention to the ferment among Black Americans in northern urban ghettos from 1964 to 1967 that fostered the Black Power movement. In November 1968, Bobby Seale led a delegation of the Black Panther Party to the Hemispheric Conference to end the war in Vietnam, held in Montreal. Among the 1,500 delegates was a contingent of Quebecois secessionists. The startling similarities of the treatment of largely rural Catholic French speakers of Quebec and the condition of African Americans south of the border did not escape the attention of Montreal's preeminent English language author, Hugh McLennan. In Return of the Sphinx, McLennan's 1967 novel about the rise of Quebec nationalism, the vocally nationalistic char character Aimé La Tendresse argues that the politeness of a subject people has always been the trump card of a ruling class. 
who have been the politest people in the United States? The Negroes. Next slide. In the years leading up to the Quiet Revolution, it was fairly common for Canadians of both linguistic backgrounds to describe their distinctiveness in racial terms. Historically, the two solitudes were understood as what Lubin calls divergent racial inheritances. But cloaking the two solitudes in the language of biological determinism really was, according to Lubin, a code word in Canadian political discourse for the much more complex conception of nationality. The issue of distinctiveness came to a head in 1963, when Prime Minister Lester B. Pearson convened the Laurendeau Dunton Commission, the Royal Commission on Bilingualism and Biculturalism, sometimes known as the By and By Commission, to probe disparities between the two solitudes. In that same year, Marshall McLuhan sent to the Royal Commission a paper drawing attention to the extent to which the two solitudes already appeared to be polarized, and in which he also reflected on the way the fairly new electronic medium of television would further abet the deterioration of relations between them. Interestingly enough, uh, McLuhan decided to uh, send a copy of that paper to Pierre Trudeau, uh, who was teaching law in Montreal at the time. The Royal Commission's findings would later provide the impetus for Prime Minister Pierre Trudeau's personal political quest and concomitant crusade against Quebec nationalism. According to Alan Mills, Trudeau believed that the independence of Quebec would be a tragedy and a defiance and betrayal of the pluralism that existed in Quebec itself. Trudeau's desire to preserve Canadian unity was met with a less than enthusiastic response among Quebec's political elite and radical elements. As Trudeau hardened his position, Quebec nationalism adopted an increasingly fundamentalist and separatist character. Now, Marshall McLuhan's Western Canadian upbringing would likely have kept him at some psychic distance from the turbulence in Quebec. Nevertheless, observing events unfolding in Quebec from the sheltering environment of St. Michael's College in Toronto, Marshall McLuhan appeared genuinely concerned for the future uh, of Quebec and publicly espoused an affinity for the plight of Quebec francophones. McLuhan understood the consequences of technological shifts upon cultural identity what Mills refers to as the serious consequences of societies with very different types of consciousness interacting with each other in the electronic age. McLuhan was keenly aware that the English Canadians were the environment of French Canada. He viewed the sometimes violent perturbations in Quebec's political and social climate as a quest for identity. McLuhan contended in his last television interview, long after the October crisis, that Quebec francophones likely were feeling very abrasive about the English community. Let's resume the slides. McLuhan's French translator in Montreal, journalist Jean Paré, recalls that McLuhan had once admitted in private that he would have fought alongside um, the French against the English had he, McLuhan, been a French Canadian. According to Douglas Copeland, McLuhan's work shied away from overt political judgments and focused rather on the implications of environmental transformations in consciousness induced by media. Thus, McLuhan's confession with regard to transformations in Quebec following the Quiet Revolution clearly takes on a political tone. By the Quiet Revolution, mounting social and economic challenges had many, had many in the province believing that profound change was long overdue. Underlying tensions began to multiply, especially as francophones were being introduced to an electronically mediated consumer lifestyle. The first two CBC television stations went on the air in 1952, one in Toronto, the other in Montreal. By 1960, the principal leisure activity of Canadians was watching television. There were 47 stations across Canada, either fully owned by government or private affiliates, linked by a multi-million dollar microwave network. In that same year, three quarters of Canadian homes owned at least one television set. Average viewing time was six hours per day. A quarter of the population, those living closest to the US border, had access to American network stations. In 1961, Télémétropole, the precursor to TVA, was awarded a license to operate an all French language station in the Montreal area. While the language barrier provides, most mo provides modest protection from American mass media infiltration into Quebec, such popular media forms as television penetrating from the US have nonetheless proven substantial and persistent. Television certainly did not give rise to French Canadian nationalism. Nonetheless, 
Paré contends there was a commonly held belief in the decade following the Quiet Revolution that television permitted Quebec francophones to take stock of their majority standing in their own province and appreciate their role as a distinct people within Canada as a whole, not merely an ethnic minority stuck in a one-down position in greater English-speaking Canada. Television dramatically reoriented French speakers' understanding of themselves and their status at home in Quebec, thus prompting Quebec francophones to profoundly question their institutional relationships with English-speaking Canada and the nagging contextual challenges of integrating into larger uh, Canadian society. What McLuhan termed the shock of recognition. In electric information environment, McLuhan asserts, minority groups can no longer be contained, ignored. Too many people know too much about each other. According to McLuhan, the consequence of such a culturally seismic shift is a message of total change, ending psychic, social, economic, and political parochialism. The old civic state and national groupings have become unworkable. McLuhan saw a concomitant evolution of mass communication media, globalization, and decentralization, what he famously termed the global village, as a competitive, highly fractious retribalization of the planet. Let's go to the next uh, slide. McLuhan's contemporary and rival at the University of Toronto, Northrop Frye, perhaps captured the essence of the global village, calling it a horrifying vision, at once completely centralized and completely decentralized, with all its senses assailed at once, in a state of terror and anxiety at once stagnant and chaotic, equally in tyranny and an anarchy. While some interpreted Quebec nationalism as a sign of progress, McLuhan saw the progress promised by nationalism as a regress, what Robert Reich recently called a reversion to tribalism that is pulling us away from nation states. By contrast, Trudeau was convinced modern technology could be a potential unifier, something which could transcend borders. Yet, perhaps Trudeau and McLuhan saw things more eye to eye than we would be led to believe. In his 1970 work, Culture is Our Business, McLuhan borrows a quote right out of Trudeau's federalism in the French Canadians in order to justify the idea in Terence W. Gordon's words, nationhood has been made obsolete by the electronic tribalization of Western culture. Next slide. Although McLuhan appeared genuinely concerned for the future of Quebec, he would find himself drawn to the man who ultimately would make the, the province the battle line in the fight for the future of Canadian Confederation. Trudeau clearly intrigued McLuhan, although from all evidence, not necessarily in a political way. The admiration, it seems, was mutual. McLuhan and Trudeau, Catholics both, were attracted to each other from the outset, writes Mills. Trudeau treated McLuhan as a sort of guru or seer whose insights he might use to political advantage. We know from McLuhan's correspondence, for example, in the compendium of letters published posthumously by his wife Corinne, and in Elaine Kahn's recent and thoughtfully annotated volume of Trudeau-McLuhan correspondence, that he conducted regular exchanges with Trudeau before and while Trudeau was prime minister. The cordial relationship between the two developed into a full friendship. McLuhan's letters reflected this evolution. Throughout the 1960s, McLuhan in his letters politely addressed Trudeau as Pierre Trudeau, Mr. Trudeau, and then Mr. Prime Minister. By the early 1970s, McLuhan was starting his letters with the salutation, Dear Pierre. Margaret Trudeau also remembers McLuhan as a regular lunch guest at 24 Sussex Drive while Pierre Trudeau was Prime Minister. Trudeau, of course, had been a devout Federalist long before his friendship with McLuhan. Ramsey Cook, another of Trudeau's friends and confidants, recounts that in 1964, with the Quiet Revolution in full swing, Trudeau and six others penned a manifesto against the increasing nationalist rhetoric issuing from Quebec. They argued against ideological sloganeering and for concrete solutions to Quebec's problems, noting that such militancy was merely a smokescreen for middle class interests and offered little in the way of real economic and social problem solving. Some years earlier, in the 1950s, Trudeau led a group of thinkers in an effort to expose what they saw as the fundamental flaw in Quebec society, a lack of democracy. The Cité Libre group, who Cook calls the philosophers of the Quiet Revolution, published their exhortations in a magazine, but also employed a number of media outlets, including Radio-Canada, to disseminate their message. Prior to the Quiet Revolution, young French Canadians often looked to such federal institutions as the CBC in order to express themselves free of the restraints of the Duplessis government in Quebec. 
Cité Libre held that nationalism was merely the rhetoric of vested interests who opposed social change, and that the state had to play an active role in fomenting social and industrial development. During the 1968 parliamentary campaign, the charismatic Trudeau consistently drew large crowds in a public, crisis, a public circus, the media called Trudeau mania. The content of his pronouncements appeared less important than the frenzy in which he made those pronouncements. According to Ramsey Cook, much of what Trudeau said at his campaign stops was impromptu and unrehearsed. Oh, gee, that sounds familiar. Uh, journalists were hard pressed to capture any substantive textual messages. And Trudeau was very much aware of the effect he had upon his publics. By the time he became prime minister, Trudeau was already comfortable with being on camera. He seemed to display a natural ease with the cool medium of television. Trudeau intuitively grasped the implications of television, Alan Mills writes. According to B.W. Pau, Trudeau was the Canadian TV statesman, the first to understand, or merely use, the searing webs of association that stream from our screen. In an early instance of Trudeau's innate appreciation of television, he defied rioters assailing him on the eve of 1968 parliamentary elections at a Saint-Jean-Baptiste parade in, in Montreal. Live before nationwide television audiences, Trudeau resisted the efforts of his own bodyguards to protect him from the bottles and bricks flung in his direction. With the previous day's images etched in their minds, many Canadians headed to the polls certain Trudeau was the man who would stand up to the separatists. And again, as the October crisis engulfed the headlines, Paul Litt writes, Trudeau's tough guy persona trumped his highly touted credentials as a civil libertarian. While in his public discourse, McLuhan espoused an apparent affinity for the plight of Quebec francophones, it also seems Northrop Fry saw McLuhan's hand at work in undermining their revolutionary goals. Fry appears to have laid the blame for Quebec's shift to tribalism, not so much on television, but rather on McLuhan's advising of Trudeau from the time Trudeau became prime minister. Power reminds us that Trudeau powerfully gravitated toward McLuhan's vision in which separatism was seen as viciously regressive, a retreating into isolated groups only to be achieved through the purgation of others and bloodletting. Evidence does suggest that McLuhan offered the prime minister his ideas about ways to use mass media to Ottawa's advantage in dealing with Quebec. The basis of such ideas was nothing new to McLuhan. In 1953, the Ford Foundation awarded a grant to a University of Toronto faculty group spearheaded by McLuhan and Edmund Carpenter. According to William J. Buxton, the two-year effort emphasized language, culture, and human senses in relation to communication. The project built a substantial inventory of network contacts and resources. The group, in the, collab in the collaboration with the CBC, also tested the efficacy of message conveyance to television audiences. Next slide. Although McLuhan was unsuccessful in soliciting funding from the Ford Foundation for further projects, the University of Toronto in 1967 lent its support to bringing into being McLuhan's idea for a Center for Culture and Technology. While the establishment of the center might be viewed as one of the latent outcomes of um, uh, McLuhan's experience working with the Ford Foundation, the grant program was, in Buxton's opinion, a major impetus to McLuhan's influ influential work in communication and media. Curiously, in the 1950s, the foundation was busy underwriting psychological warfare and propaganda research, funding dozens of American social scientists, among them five of the most prestigious communication theorists in the US at the time, Hadley Cantrell, Harold Laswell, Daniel Lerner, Itael de Sola Poul, and the highly prolific scholar Wilbur Schramm. What is less known is that the Ford Foundation served as a cover for military intelligence and CIA operations that funneled hundreds of thousands of dollars, probably more, into foundation-sponsored communication research projects. Next slide. When Hugh McLennan's monumental work, Two Solitudes, was first published in 1945, Critics hailed the book as the great Canadian novel. By the Quiet Revolution, McLennan's narrative, which dealt with the nagging issue of French-English relations, had lost much of its relevance. Critics panned McLennan's 1967 novel, Return of the Sphinx, and um, strangely, I think actually 
Return of the Sphinx is his best novel. And they dismiss McLennan's work as uncomprehending of the real Francophone experience in Canada. McLennan had originally expressed sympathy and support for the political and cultural changes taking hold in Quebec. Yet by the time Pierre Trudeau became prime minister in 1968, McLennan's rhetoric about Quebec had undergone a transformation. According to McLennan's biographer, Elspeth Cameron, McLennan believed Trudeau could turn the tide even in the face of escalating tensions in Quebec. McLennan looked upon Trudeau as the philosopher king and even considered incorporating Trudeau's 1968 victory as the final scene of a film version of Return of the Sphinx. Although McLennan lauded Trudeau's use of the War Measures Act to quell separatist terrorism, he appeared to assert McLuhan's novel ideas about mediated environments were somehow responsible for fomenting much of the trouble and spurring on the separatists. McLennan did not even refer to McLuhan by name. Instead, he condescendingly called McLuhan media's guru. Yet in his writing, McLennan provides evidence of his conviction that television, in fact, had played a crucial role in the amplification of French nationalism in 1960s Quebec. In Return of the Sphinx, the reader experiences Quebec militancy in support of the province's separation, largely through McLennan's descriptions of what is airing on television. For example, in the opening sequences of the novel, characters frequently make reference to live news stories about a French nationalist riot in downtown Montreal. The main character, Daniel Ansley, the host of a highly rated talk show on the CBC, appears to be a key provocateur of the unrest, underscoring McLennan's conviction that Quebec francophones knew Radio-Canada was strongly separatist. Like many young people of that decade, Daniel understands the nature of this mediated environment, what McLuhan refers to as the electric drama. In November 1970, McLennan authored an article about the October crisis for the Toronto Telegram, in which he drew largely from his personal ideas expressed in Return of the Sphinx and praised Trudeau. The same month, McLennan, writing in the Gazette, compared FLQ members to Nazis. As the crisis played out, McLennan believed himself to have become an FLQ target. In a 1971 essay in McLean's, McLennan wrote that as the October crisis unfolded, he and his second wife would take turns keeping watch through the night at their place in the eastern townships, should a car come up to the cottage filled with masked young men. Fearing for his life, the author and his wife eventually deserted their exposed cottage in the eastern townships for the relative safety of their Montreal apartment. When Trudeau sent tanks into the streets of Montreal in October 1970, Trudeau's critics smelled a conspiracy, what some have called Trudeau's darkest hours, a pseudo event concocted merely to intimidate Quebec separatists. Purposely staged or not, the crisis to many felt like a reprise of England's subjugation and humiliation of French speaking Canada in the aftermath of the conquest more than two centuries earlier. The subsequent century, propelled by technological innovation, was to become historically noteworthy for English Canada. The 1800s, however, would become remarkable in French-speaking Quebec for the relative absence of political, social, and cultural development. In a 1968 letter to Pierre Trudeau, Marshall McLuhan writes, French Canada never had a 19th century. Elsewhere, McLuhan notes that the defeat suffered by the French during the conquest stimulated the feeling of an historical present that was absent in the victors. This is echoed by Jocelyn Le Tourneau, who claims Quebec francophones remain fundamentally stuck in a kind of dialectic of past and present for which they find no solution in either politics or memory. Hugh McLennan, writing in the Journal of the Council of Foreign Relations, captured it this way. The glorious past of French Canada has overshadowed her immediate present ever since 1763. Not only were the French Canadians robbed of the mother country when France deserted them, they were robbed of one of the greatest dreams ever cherished by a human society, the dream of a French-speaking Roman Catholic empire extending from the Gaspé to the Gulf of Mexico. And we can get out of the slides now. The conquest emerged out of the prolonged erosion of French Romanization in the face of unrelenting advance of Anglo-Saxon hegemony. The occupation of Montreal by Canadian troops in October 1970 therefore brought more than 300 years of defeat cascading down on French Canadians. 
Friedrich Nietzsche and later Mircea Eliade term this recurrence of historical narratives the eternal return, in which we tend to act out versions of the same stories time and again. Or as Homi K. Baba aptly describes it, the past is seen, seen as returning with uncanny punctuality to render the event timeless and the narrative of its emergence transparent. Thank you for listening today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jonathan. Uh, wonderful uh, presentation, very clear. Uh, I'm, I'm fascinated by this, uh, uh, by this topic because I, as someone who, who has studied nationalism, um, I, I understand the, the fact that McLuhan influenced the study of nationalism in a big way. Benedict Anderson, for example, who wrote Imagine Communities, uh, yes. based his work largely on, on McLuhan's insight, which is quite interesting. Yes. And so political scientists and sociologists to study nationalism have an indirect debt towards McLuhan. So I find your, from my disciplinary perspective, I, I find your, your talk uh, really fascinating. Well, thank you. Yeah. And of course, uh, and, and, and McLuhan, um, uh, as uh, Copeland, uh, one of his biographers, remarks, uh, really didn't take a, a uh, what were an overtly political approach. He was mostly interested in nationalism as a uh, result of uh, changes to uh, mediated environments. Absolutely, yes. It, it, we we can certainly talk more about about this, but I just want to invite people to ask their questions uh, in the Q and A um, section or even the chat. Um, so below, uh, and, and I will then read you the, the questions and, and then you can uh, answer them. So that's the way uh, we will uh, proceed. But tell us a bit about the, the book that you're writing, uh, because it's well, related to, but it's part of a bigger, your talk is part of a bigger project, right? Yeah, and, and, and this was just, you know, there was a, a tease of some of the uh, ideas. And, and actually, I was supposed to have been on sabbatical uh, this semester from SUNY Plattsburgh, but because of the COVID crisis, all of the leaves were, uh, revo uh, were revoked, and um, I was going to be spending the semester uh, really uh, doing you know, uh, considerable research uh, and, and writing. Um, uh, but actually, this this idea um, for this uh, book, which which looks at that 11 year period uh, from 1960, the Quiet Revolution to the October Crisis, and in, in 1970, um, began 10 years ago, at mm -hmm. the 40th anniversary of the October Crisis, and 2011, the following year, uh, was the centenary of Marshall McLuhan, which was marked by a, a Media Ecology Association uh, conference. Uh, in uh, at um, in Edmonton at the uh, University of Alberta campus uh, there, and um, uh, I, I had a chance to attend and 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 talk at that that conference. But it it sort of uh, started as a sort um, uh, almost a cavalier conversation I was having uh, with with my wife at the breakfast table uh, during the uh, anniversary of the Quiet Revolution, and I, you know, and I'm and I already knew that there was going to be this centenary celebration. And I was wondering, could there be a connection between the October crisis and, um, uh, and, and Marshall McLuhan? And um, I, I started to delve and, and I've been delving ever since and turning up all sorts of very interesting uh, 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 connections. Uh, so uh, it's, it's fascinating work. I'm, uh, I, uh, I'm passionately interested in it uh, because it's just one of those things where uh, I'm, I'm turning up new and, and surprising stuff um, all the time. Very good. Uh, really uh, good luck in completing this manuscript. I, I know our book writing is can be all consuming and it's difficult when you're uh, uh, teaching or doing other uh, administrative tasks, but uh, I hope that you, uh, you get the the, the time you deserve to, to complete this project. So Thank you. Now we have some questions. So um, first question, um, Chris is asking, uh, uh, Chris Bourne, uh, I would be interested in hearing more about Fry's criticism of McLuhan's stoking of Quebecois nationalism. Well, uh, it's, it's not terribly lengthy criticism. It shows up as um, a... Um, a couple of comments uh, in in um, 
uh, uh, Fry's, uh, one of Fry's uh, uh, works. Um, it's, you know, I, I just put it out there. Um, you know, obviously there was a, a rivalry between, an intellectual rivalry between Fry and, and McLuhan, but they also were colleagues and, and um, you know, uh, intellectual peers. And so it's hard to say um, how uh, credible that might have been. But, um, you know, the, the thing is, is that uh, what, what's interesting is that McLennan, you McLennan, is, is sort of saying the same things at the same time for the same uh, uh, reasons. And, um, you know, what the implication is more from McLennan than from Fry is, is that McLuhan's work uh, as Paré uh, intimates, intimates uh, uh, McLuhan's work was, was known uh, to the, um, uh, to the uh, FFQ uh, members, most, most likely. And, and you have to remember that the FFQ, um, while they might have seemed like a ragtag bunch of terrorists, many of them were highly intellectual. Uh, people like um, uh, Pierre Vallier, um, who had just gone through a rudimentary, um, uh, typical uh, French language education in, in Quebec uh, during his formative years, uh, was a, uh, he was an intellectual sponge. He read everything he could uh, come across, uh, all of the philosophers and writers. So I'm, I'm, I'm sure that um, maybe not Vallier, but others were familiar. And, and, and Paré was not, his, was not McLuhan's first translator. Um, McLuhan's uh, understanding media uh, had been uh, first translated in, in France uh, before making its way into the Quebec market because it was... Um, in the 1960s, even after the Quiet Revolution, um, you know, Quebec didn't really have much of a, a literary scene of its um, uh, own. Uh, it took a number of, of years. And so um, uh, Paré is actually not the first translator of, of McLuhan. And he actually retranslates Understanding Media uh, and two other works. I think there's a total of three works that Paré translated. Um, uh, but um, uh, it was clear that, that the, 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 the people who were uh, stoking revolution in Quebec knew of McLuhan's work, knew of the, um, the role of media, and actually were, were, were uh, employing it. Uh, I mean, they did ask that this manifesto be read on, on, on television. So they were, were not oblivious to media's role. And, and that's why uh, McLennan, I think more than Fry, uh, launches this, um, uh, this attack on, on, on McLuhan. Thank you. And we have another question from Andrew McLuhan. Um, and who thanks you for your stimulating talk. What, was there oh. any indication from the FLQ uh, uh, separatist side that they had any awareness or opinion on Martian McLuhan's work or supposed involvement? So what did they know about McLuhan? Um, well, uh, thank you, uh, Andrew, for, and, and thank you for attending. Uh, it's uh, lovely to have you here. Um, and, and Andrew, by the way, is doing some, some really great work uh, about his grandfather in the McLuhan Institute. And I wish him lots and lots of uh, success with that. Um, I really don't know. Uh, I really don't know the answer to that question. I, I haven't delved that, that far. Um, uh, I'm really, I, I can only surmise and, and I don't really want to speculate uh, a, a, about the uh, familiarity that the FLQ might have had uh, with, uh, they may have had some sort of broad ideas, but I would, I would surmise that they knew. And, and there have been, there's been a, 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 just like at the 40th anniversary, the 50th anniversary is producing some new volumes uh, coming out of, of um, uh, coming out on the 50th anniversary. And there's a, just a brand new book. I haven't read it yet. I've just sort of leafed through it uh, by uh, uh, Robert Como. Uh, who was an FLQ member at the time during the October crisis, uh, implicated in the October crisis, who um, uh, became a historian, uh, he uh, teaches uh, history, um, and it's uh, called Mon Octobre, My October, and uh, I'm, uh, I'm sure I'll get some further insight. So I'm, I'm going to uh, plead ignorance. I'm, I'm not really um, uh, sure to what extent uh, McLuhan's work was, was known of. And, and as I said, if, if they were reading, if anybody was reading it like prior to, um, you know, the late sixties, it had to be in English because the, the first translations didn't really make their way into uh, Francophone hands until the later, uh, the, the latter part of the sixties. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. Really interesting issue. And uh, I think if you, you mentioned Valière, obviously his intellectual horizon was more decolonization, Franz Fanon and, and right. Marxism. Right. Uh, so it would be interesting to know whether he actually read uh, uh, Mc, McLuhan and asked yeah. maybe some of the surviving uh, members of the FLQ whether they were aware of, of his yeah. at the time. Well, you know, in Negre Blanc d'Amérique, he, he, he devotes, I, I would say, and I'm exaggerating, but about a third of that book, which is, a, which is very autobiographical, to his reading list. He was a voracious reader and he read, he read the, the Marxists and the neo Marx. he read Fanon, he read Mimi, and, and, and um, uh, he was an autodidact. He, he, he taught himself revolution. And of course, his time with some of these black nationalists in, in the tombs, in, in, and then when he went on this fact-finding tour in the United States, meeting with members of the um, um, Black Panthers and, and, and uh, uh, some of the other uh, black liberation uh, groups, um, he was he was just you know formulating in his mind what revolution in Quebec mm -hmm. might might look like. Um, uh, so I, he doesn't mention anything about McLuhan, uh, but I, I, there is a, a a fairly recent biography that came out which I haven't yet uh, uh, completely plowed through. So there might be some mention there, but um, uh, I wouldn't be surprised. But then again, I'm I'm I. I would doubt it, though. So. And just a note from Andrew McLuhan that Marshall McLuhan had a copy of uh, Les Negres Blancs d'Amérique by Vallière. So, of course, he, uh, uh, he was interested in Quebec nationalism, uh, as you mentioned. Of course. And, of yes. course. Yeah. So that's not surprising, but that's really fascinating. So let's uh, go back to the... Yes, to see. So hopefully we'll have more, uh, more questions. Um, uh, and uh, from our, our, our friends. So please write, don't be afraid. You can write down your question, a comment, reaction in the chat box or in uh, the Q&A. Um, so can I, I have to, I'm a bit curious about the personal relationship between McLuhan and, and Trudeau, because he said McLuhan was not necessarily a political animal. Uh, do you know if McLuhan ever belonged to a political party? Was this was he close to the Liberal Party in any way, or he, he has just had a personal relationship with Trudeau, the man? Um, I, I don't know the answer to his, you know his political affiliations. Maybe Andrew could fill us in on on that. Um, the um, uh, you know what McLuhan, you know McLuhan's relationship with Trudeau, of course, was was uh, at first cordial and then and then friendly. But you know what's very telling is is that he spotted something in Trudeau because he probably was was reading the the Cité Libre stuff um, uh, in the 1950s and and some of the stuff that uh, some of the material that that um, Trudeau was writing. So that's that's probably the impetus for him sending the copy of his. Um, his paper that he sent to the, the by and by commission, sending a copy to uh, Trudeau, um, uh, who was teaching law at the time at uh, in, in Montreal. Um, so I I, I I think that the um, the attraction uh, was a was a personal attraction. Um, you know, they they saw an affinity in, in each other, and of course uh, Trudeau was reading McLuhan, um, and 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 saw some things that were uh, quite useful. And then of course, um, Trudeau uh, reciprocated in Culture is Our Business by uh, quoting um, uh, the, uh, uh, Trudeau's work on, on um, Canada and the French Canadians. Um, you know, of course, what was, was close to, um, uh, and I'm, I'm understating it, what was quite close uh, to, um, to uh, McLuhan's heart was his relationship with Catholicism. Um, you know, he was a, a he would attend noon mass um, uh, every day in, in Toronto. Uh, he um, he was not ashamed of integrating his uh, uh, his his beliefs, uh, his uh, uh, his love for Catholicism, and and his I would say his intellectual love for Catholicism. Uh, into his uh, pronouncements and his uh, theorizing uh, about uh, media ecology, um, and and also you know keep in mind that uh, Trudeau was was also a Catholic, so there was some affinity there, and and um, 
a doctoral student uh, who has since uh, uh, passed away in, in uh, Montreal, Liz Jeffries, uh, talked about, um, uh, many years ago, talked about uh, uh, McLuhan sort of seeing himself as an outsider because he had converted to Catholicism. Uh, he had purposely uh, taken on that, that role. And in English-speaking Canada, which of course is largely Protestant, he, he uh, put himself in that outsider position. And that's probably um, uh, what, uh, you know, to a certain extent, what abetted his uh, sympathies, his empathies for the uh, Quebec Francophone uh, struggle, because of course, Quebec Francophones are by and large uh, Roman Catholic. Um, so there was probably some sort of, of uh, uh, it resonated for him, the struggle resonated in him, but at the same time, what resonated for him was this, this uh, deep friendship that he developed with uh, Trudeau, and he was helping uh, Trudeau. Un undoubtedly, we, we, we know it from the letters. We, um, uh, and some of the letters aren't even between uh, McLuhan and Trudeau. They're between McLuhan and some of Trudeau's uh, inner circle. Um, uh, we, we know it from um, uh, Trudeau's uh, own uh, writings, and we also have, have, we know from photographs uh, where you know, Trudeau and, and McLuhan are seen going to uh, restaurants uh, together. Uh, uh, McLuhan was hosted at uh, 24 Sussex Drive uh, uh, in one of her two autobiographies. Margaret Trudeau um, mentions McLuhan uh, uh, two or three times. So uh, he, he was a prominent figure in Trudeau's life and, and Trudeau was a, 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 a prominent figure in McLuhan's life. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. So we have other questions. Nancy Helms asks, are any of the ancestors of the FLQ connected to the French Revolution? Now, I suppose I understand this question as, do they have roots in terms of their genealogy? But I, I think that might be surprising just because uh, uh, what Nouvelle France ceased to exist before the French Revolution. And, and um, but, but in terms of uh, the, in the work of Vallière or others, do we see a connection with the French revolutionary tradition, for example? Um, I don't recall any any really um, uh, citing of of the the French revolutionary tradition. What what um, uh, Vallière was a Marxist, um, and and many of the FLQ were also uh, uh, Marxists. And so they were more connected to the notion of Marxist or Marxian uh, revolution. Um, and uh, you cited uh, France Fanon, you know, mm -hmm. Les Damnés de la Terre, the, the Wretched of the Earth, uh, which, was, um, uh, which was a very critical manifesto for revolutionary, not just in, in Quebec, but revolutionary movements in Europe and, and you know, that, that whole um, uh, decolonization uh, in, in North Africa in the 19, uh, late 1950s, early 1960s. Um, and, and, you know, Fanon basically endorses violence as a legitimate means to um, overthrow the shackles of uh, colonial uh, overlords. And, 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 you know, we, we definitely see uh, the FLQ adopting um, that uh, Fanon-esque um, uh, ph philosophy. They, they were unabashed... Um, uh, advocates of the use of, of violence, and and, um, and and you know that's why you know Vallier also draws from the the uh, the Black Liberation Movement. Uh, some of the black we can't we we can't label the entire Black Liberation Movement in in the United States as a uh, a movement endorsing violence. There were there were uh, nonviolent um, uh, movements among the Black Liberation uh, groups, but some endorsed uh, uh, violence. Uh, you know. Um, uh, we have that famous, you know, fi uh, picture of uh, Huey Newton, the uh, head of the uh, Black Panthers, on his wicker throne with a um, uh, a large um, uh, shotgun or rifle. I can't remember which, uh, and a sp spear in one hand and a rifle in, in in the other. So, so clearly, there's a at least a symbolic endorsement of of, of violence. We know that, for example, the Black Panthers. Um, uh, uh, entered the um, uh, the state legislature in in Sacramento, uh, uh, fully armed at at, at one point. Uh, so um, there, 
I would say that the, the, the French Revolution um, doesn't really resonate. As you've mentioned, French Revolution is, is already uh, uh, post Nouvelle France. Um, the, uh, the, the, the real influence was, was, the, uh, was, was Marx and, and the um, uh, post Marxian mm -hmm. thinkers and philosophers. And the perception of France among the people like Valier was not very positive at the time because what they had in mind is not so much the French Revolution but the Guerre d'Algérie and so where the France was the colonial, colonial oppressive power. Uh, so that may have also uh, tainted their perspective. Right, but keep in mind, you know, Charles de Gaulle <laughs> visits Quebec. True. <laughs> and, and his famous, you know, uh, pronouncement, um, uh, Vive le Québec libre. And, and that was a galvanizing moment. And, mm -hmm. and, and um, uh, no matter what one thought of, of, of Charles de Gaulle, because he was a controversial f figure, uh, no matter what one thought, that was, that was, um, a, uh, that was almost like a, a call to arms for mm -hmm. uh, many of the uh, um, uh, revolutionaries in, in Quebec at, at the time. And, and um, it was... Uh, uh, it was good or bad timing, depending upon which side of the barricades you were on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, that's a very interesting uh, discussion about the, the relationship between uh, uh, the, the, the emerging sovereignty movement in Quebec and France. And we can see that there they were some tensions or some ambiguity here, at least before General de Gaulle spoke. And right. de Gaulle was not a leftist. Huh? No. <laughs> he was a conservative. No. Not, not at all. Not at so all. which is, uh, adds uh, another layer to this, uh, to this story. Yeah. So we have more questions, of course. Sure. So Jean-François Jean Vallée. Uh, thank Jean you. For... Hello. Yes, Jean-François Vallée. Um, when you were speaking of Trudeau's ease in front of television cameras because of his cool nature, you compared his off the cuff improvised manner of speaking on TV to a contemporary orange politician, a Trump, uh, we all recognize. Uh, as you know, Trudeau and McLuhan, uh, although they both seem uh, uh, at ease with the new media of television, had a deep deeply literate education. Uh, what has changed in the meantime? How can we understand and differentiate the televised improvisations of Trump in comparison to those of early uh, television politicians such as JFK or Pierre Trudeau? That's a rhetorical question, right? Uh, <laughs> um, I, I, think, I think you answered your own question, but yes. Um, the 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 uh, I think that what what um, from a media ecological uh, perspective, early television, of course, and and politicians using television. Early television is emerging uh, out of of a, a literate era. Um, we're we're clearly well beyond the um, the emphasis on literacy that we saw still in the mid and and um, late mid twentieth um, century. Um, so to be literate, to be schooled, and to um, uh, you know be able to um, provide evidence of that literacy is no longer a as valued today as it had been, let's say, in the time of, of uh, JFK. And and we see that, of course, we we see a, a diminishing. I guess we could call it a diminishing eloquence quotient in in our our, our leaders. Of course, there are some some exceptions. But um, I mean, if you're going to put a, a JFK against a, a, a Donald uh, Trump, they're, they're, the comparison is, is almost um, absurd. It's almost um, uh, ridiculous. So, um, and I think that it's not just a question of what's going on in, in political circles. It's, it's the culture in general, especially in the United States. Um, and uh, Jean-Francois, I'm sure that you see it in your students. I see it in, 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 in my students. Oh, and by the way, Jean-Francois, congratulations on becoming a professor of uh, philosophy. <laughs> they, 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 well, he was on, a, on an interview on radio and they, they, they misidentified him as a professor of philosophy. So. Um, but anyhow, uh, no, it's a great question. And uh, I, I think um, uh, I think that the, the the level of discourse is is certainly um, uh, deteriorated uh, tremendously, and it's it's deteriorated also sort of concomitantly with uh, the um, the sort of the twenty four hours uh, uh, seven day continued 
onslaught of, of television uh, content and, and this, this need to fill, especially in the news cycle, the need to fill uh, the news cycle with, um, uh, uh, with content, even if that, that content is largely meaningless. So I don't know if that answers your question, John Francois. I, I know I've sort of like trying to avoid some of it, but yeah. But we have more questions. So Hélène Kahn, uh, Jonathan, have you found uh, anything to show that McLuhan was directly advising Trudeau or Trudeau's advisors on the October crisis in practical media policy handling as the events were unfolding, as opposed to theoretical influence? So is there any evidence that Mar McLuhan advised the Trudeau team or Trudeau himself about this specific moment? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, there, there, there is certainly implications uh, and, um, uh, but whether or not there was, uh, if there was like a, a formal consultancy role, probably not. And, and, um, you know, I think that the relationship and, and it was more uh, Trudeau seeing McLuhan as a, as, a, as a guru rather than as a political um, consultant. And that um, Trudeau was certainly, you know, over, uh, um, you know, over meals uh, listening to, um, to McLuhan and, and vice versa. Uh, you know, McLuhan, as you know, because you, you uh, uh, assembled those, those letters, um, uh, uh, M M McLuhan was watching Trudeau very carefully. He was looking at his manner of, of dress um, and his, um, uh, you know, his facial hair and, and making remarks, sending, sending Trudeau uh, his commentaries on how he was looking on television, and I'm sure Trudeau was, was um, taking this into account, but you know, Trudeau was his own man also, so he's not necessarily hanging on every word of McLuhan, but McLuhan was taking a, a, uh, a very intimate interest in uh, Trudeau's television presence. To what extent, um, I haven't yet uh, uncovered anything that would show uh, where there's a, a direct and um, uh, intentional, you know, as if it, like a contractual relationship, but I don't think that they needed to have a contractual relationship. As a matter of fact, I think that, that would have been sort of um, uh, counterintuitive to, 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 to both of them, and it would be, have been probably antithetical to their relationship. I think that they trusted one another enough, from what I can tell, that um, uh, they, um, uh, they related to each other as, as two um, very astute, smart uh, men. Yes. So we have another question. Uh, and uh, it's a question by uh, Beirut Farivar. Uh, very informative lecture in less than 30 minutes. It's true. Concise. If Radio Canada um, television um, uh, was instrumental in awakening the Retribalization re tendencies in Quebec, would it be fair to assume that the advent of technology and social media over the last decade have played a role in moderating the nationalist tendencies in Quebec? For example, by allowing some Quebecois uh, to become member of other tribes, quote unquote. So um, I don't know what, <laughs> you know, what McLuhan will say. Uh, W W uh, M D, <laughs> but um, um, you know about this or what you think. But uh, it's an interesting question in terms of social media and nationalism, and especially support for sovereignty. Is there a connection? Yeah, um, I think that the the uh, the question is uh, it's a crucial question, uh, and it's a point that I I make at the end of a. Uh, um, uh, an article uh, many years ago is that um, the internet and now with social media, people can uh, put on many different identities, not just uh, political identities, but uh, 
you know, um, identities that have to do with their sexual orientation, with their religion, with their ethnicity. Um, and, and so you're not necessarily con confined to a public uh, political or social uh, identity. And I think that that does have a, um, uh, an effect of uh, diffusing and diffusing uh, some of the um, stronger nationalistic uh, uh, tendencies, not just um, here in Quebec, but, but elsewhere in the world. However, you flip that coin over, and what we, what we are also seeing is that social media, of course, amplifies um, uh, extremist uh, tendencies. Uh, it, it, it starts to give a voice to uh, groups uh, and individuals who may not have had a, an effective a voice um, otherwise. So it's, it's a, it is a two-sided um, coin. It, it, in, in, in one instance, it's, it's detribalizing, but in the same instance, it's, it's, it's tribalizing. Um, so it's uh, you know, pushing one effect uh, to its sort of logical limit and it's, and it's pushing another effect also to its logical limit. And, and they're not, they're not contradictory. They're that, that, um, uh, the, um, uh, you know, for, for example, uh, when, uh, if we look at the, uh, FLQ at, after the uh, October, uh, crisis, you know, the FLQ, um, pretty much, uh, uh, sort of lost any, any, um, uh, oomph that it had after the October crisis, largely because a lot of them were jailed and gone into exile. Um, but what we saw was this sort of uh, sublimation of the um, uh, the uh, political uh, beliefs and um, the uh, the revolutionary ardor. It was it was channeled. It was uh, channeled successfully into a. Um, uh, a fairly successful separatist movement, uh, uh, you know, with the um, uh, Parti Québécois, and uh, it became a force in uh, Quebec uh, life in the second half of the 20th century into the 21st um, uh, century. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm drawing a parallel there. The the uh, the internet, the World Wide Web, and of course social media in the last several years um, might have attenuated. Uh, nationalist sentiment, but what we're seeing is we're seeing the rise of extremism uh, at the same time. But that that extremism is is not necessarily um, uh, coming out of of nationalist sentiment. It's it it might be something else. Yes, like the anti-mask uh, people who have all these theory, uh, these uh, conspiracy theories about five G and so forth that create these new communities and. Uh, the far far right groups or far left groups that are maybe very fragmented, but they have also global reach, right? They are not just localized. Right. So it's right. really, really fascinating. Right. And disinformation and misinformation mm -hmm. is on an equal playing field with the truth. And, and that's what makes uh, this such a, uh, a difficult task uh, for, um, you know, a society to um, bring this under some sort of, of, of control. That's why the study of media, including social media, is more urgent than, than ever. And, and, and the work of uh, McLuhan and, and what you're doing now is also, I think, very helpful to help us understand uh, our own history, but from a, a perspective that I think is a bit neglected, uh, uh, a perspective that is quite unique. So I hope that you will finish this book soon. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> and, and maybe we'll re-invite you again for the launch of the book <laughs> in okay. a not so distant future. One, uh, one, one can only hope. Yes. So good luck with that. And thank, thank you, you very much, uh, Professor Slater Jonathan, for this wonderful talk, for answering um, all these, uh, these questions. Um, and... Um, Oh, there is a there is a last question. We just got one from Grant Favors. So let's uh, the last question. We can take it. Uh, we have time. McLuhan often treated the nation state as an epiphenomenon of the old print era. Both were obsolete in the age of electric media. Tribalism, as opposed to nationalism, fit the electric era. Yet Quebec separatists considered themselves nationalists, not tribalists. 
does this distinction between tribalism and nationalism fit Quebec? Well, that's a very interesting one. Yeah, that's a that's a um, uh, a curious and, and uh, provocative um, uh, question. Um, you know, um, I think that we can infer from McLuhan's writings that that he 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 did equate um, the Quebec nationalism with with tribalism. But I think the the person who actually uh, sees nationalism as tribalism is really Hugh McLennan. Uh, uh, writing in, in uh, Montreal, and he's writing uh, from the position of an English language writer uh, at a time when English literature in Quebec is in decline, being really pushed to the the uh, uh, the, 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 the margins. And, and um, uh, uh, Linda Leith um, uh, writes about this and talking about how the um, the English language uh, uh, literati, uh, you know, were were sort of circling the wagons by the by the nineteen sixties, and and I think that McLennan's novel, The Return of the Sphinx, um, uh, which is a fascinating book, and and I can understand why in nineteen sixty seven it was panned, but it gives a very interesting uh, perspective uh, from you know from a uh, an English writer's perspective about what was going on in uh, in Quebec uh, at the time, and and McLennan clearly sees uh, the the tension uh, as between English and French as a, as a not so much a national tension but as a a, a, a tribal tension. Um, yet, as as um, uh, my 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 dear late colleague Marty Lubin uh, uh, wrote. Um, the, uh, you know, for example, the, the longstanding uh, desire to frame English-French relations in terms of racial, uh, a, a sort of as, as, as a racial divide was in fact a, um, a, a sort of wink, wink, nod, nod, that it was in fact a, a national uh, divide. So I don't necessarily think that we can be um, create a fine dividing line between what we would call nationalism and, and, and tribalism. Uh, McLuhan himself, of course, um, you know, he, he, he talks about uh, beating the tribal drum in, in Quebec. So he's not necessarily uh, convinced of, of the pure nationalism in, in, in Quebec. He, he, he sees that as a, as a, as a, as a tribalism, as a tribal uh, movement. So I don't think that, I think there's a more of a fuzzy, uh, fuzzy dividing line than a, than a very distinct clear line between uh, those sort of two definitions. Well, uh, thank you very much, Jonathan, Professor uh, uh, Slater. That was a, a great presentation and uh, great answers. Thank you to all the, the participants, people who attended this talk, which will be available later uh, online uh, as a recording. So if you have friends who missed it uh, and, and tell them about, about it, we'll, we'll of course propagate the good news, the, the, the recording on social media. I hope that you will follow us at MISC. We are, we are on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can easily find us also on our website, just Google MISC McGill, um, and you will find us. I want to tell you uh, very quickly about our next event, which is also related to Quebec history. It's another uh, commemoration. It's about the 25th anniversary of the 1995 referendum. It's an event that will take place on October 29th um, <clears throat> at 2 p.m. Eastern. And uh, you can find more information about this event on our website, but the panelists will be Louise Baudouin and Eric Bédard, who were on the Yes Camp, and Eddie Goldenberg and John Parizella, who were on the No Camp. And the moderator will be Graham Fraser, who is oh, wow. a, a former journalist and a member of, uh, of our board here at MISC. Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Uh, allez nous voir sur notre site web, qui est aussi en français. Et, euh, et sur les médias sociaux, euh, l'Institut d'études canadiennes de McGill. Euh, je vous souhaite une bonne soirée. Take care and good night.